Medieval. What does this world suggest to you? Bad planning? The conditions in a half-finished Mediterranean holiday hotel? Or almost anything which is crude, incompetent, or unscientific? Well, think again, because medieval builders produce some of the finest structures that the world has ever seen. For their technical sophistication, engineering skill, grace, daring, and sheer size, buildings like these rank among the finest achievements of the human race. is Beverly Minster. There has been a church on or close to this site since about the year 700. But the work we see today was begun early in the 13th century and continued with breaks for about 200 years. So, the great, 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 great grandchildren of the people who began the work just might have seen it finished. 200 years sounds like a long time, but this wasn't one excruciatingly long building project but rather several smaller self-contained projects which gradually replaced the existing building on the same site. The work took place in fits and starts, bursts of activity with pauses in between. And some of the bursts were very fast. All this, for example, was put up in less than 50 years. And then there was a period when no work was done. One reason for the pause may have been the need to raise more money for it was cash flow, not any lack of technical know-how, which was often the key to progress in a medieval building program. The expenditure was not spread evenly. This shows the huge increase in the need for funds during the middle years of the construction of the church at Adebury in Oxfordshire at the beginning of the 15th century. The money for building a great church came from donations by noblemen and women, offerings by ordinary people, fundraising events, and income from church land. At some places, like Beverly, there was a shrine containing holy relics, and the money from visiting pilgrims could be considerable. When work restarted at Beverly, there had been changes. Fashion changed so quickly in the Middle Ages that if work paused for any length of time, style changed. Here in this series of carved heads, high up along the side of the church, we can see the progress in the style of headgear and hairstyle over about 80 years during the 14th century. And not just in the hairstyle. There's also a progression in design between these windows, built during the first years of work, and these, built some 80 years later. But whatever the period in Beverly, religious work could be fun too. An obvious question to ask about a structure like this is how it was built at all. And that is what this program is about. How by looking at an old building in an archaeological way, we can reconstruct some of the methods used to design and build it. Here at Beverly, we're going to follow this process through from the early stages of planning to the realization of the building on the ground, rising from the foundations to the roof. So what follows is a kind of journey, which starts in the ground beneath my feet and ends 50 meters up there. So how did a medieval builder start to design a church like this? We know that in all probability there were drawings on parchment, like these examples of St. Gaul in Switzerland. In England, hardly any drawings survive. Once the building was finished, they were considered expendable. And we know that some projects also involved the use of models, though very few have survived the centuries. The building was planned and detailed work began. As far as we know, medieval builders made no use of arithmetical calculation in their work. Instead, they used proportional geometry. The beauty of this was that even very complicated designs could be achieved with the minimum of equipment. 
The clue to how part of Beverly Minster may have been designed is demonstrated by a present-day architect. Everything is generated from a base length, and it's all done with a pair of dividers and a straight edge. So, on this example, we can take the base length there, taking it up the drawing to develop a root two in that position, which defines the top of the column of the major arcade. The root three defines the top of the capital of the major arcade. And going back to our base length again, we define the top of the bay and the top of the capital of the minor arcade. So the generation of just four arcs forms the basis of this design of a part of the Triforium in Beverly Minster. The design was decided and drawn up. Then the foundations had to be marked out. Setting out on site was done using similar methods but scaled up using pegs and cords. And when the master mason was satisfied that the correct outline had been achieved, work on the foundations could begin. But the problem is that the ground here is wet. It may not look like it today, but there is water just a short distance beneath my feet. And just how close this water is, you can see for yourselves as we go back inside the building. Next to the high altar is a medieval well. We don't know exactly why it's here, but we can imagine that medieval people used it for a variety of religious and superstitious purposes. We can see this groove where a bucket would have been passed down, and we can see where the stone has been worn smooth by the passing of a rope six centuries ago. And here is the water. So the colossal weight of the minster had to be supported by soft ground. We don't know yet exactly how they did it at Beverly because the inside of the church has never been excavated. But it wasn't a unique problem. Investigation of similar buildings on similar sites shows that one solution was to use tree trunks as piles. At nearby York, there's an example of how they got a good foundation. Here the problem was that the Minster was to be built on ground which varied greatly in its ability to bear the weight directly above it. In recent years, there's been extensive work done to preserve the Minster by replacing the foundations and there's an exhibition explaining it all down in the crypt. They found that York Minster had been built originally on a raft of huge oak beams. First, the builders had excavated a wide trench which corresponded to the outline of the building. In the trench, they laid a massive raft of lime mortar and rubble upon which was laid a mesh of oak timbers. Altogether, there were about two miles of oak trees in this substructure. It's been suggested that the purpose of the lime mortar, which is rather soft when it's fresh, may have been to provide the foundations with temporary extra rigidity to resist squeezing as the building was added on top. When the foundations were ready, work on the walls could begin, and a lot of the stone for these would have been cut and stockpiled while the foundations were being made ready. Nowadays, a power saw cuts the stone. In the Middle Ages, they used wedges to split large blocks. Medieval builders prefabricated stones back at the quarry or in a nearby yard. This is the yard at York Minster, where nowadays the work is all to do with restoration. But as well as straight building stones, there was an enormous amount of detailed work to be done. Arches, windows and such like. And it all had to be designed somewhere. Here's part of a detail as it was drawn some hundreds of years ago. It's at York, where in the Minster's tracing house you can still see some of the original working drawings which were scratched onto the soft plaster floor. We filmed a present day draftsman who was going to copy the drawing onto a piece of wood which will form a template for the cutting of the stone. You draw an arc of the outline of the tracery. Here's the other centre line, the other side. You draw that. There's the baseline of the tracery going right across. And then, so you get the bottom joint, which 
Rosie B. Look at there. This is a case where the center line will be too far away to use a straight edge. So you have a point here and a point on your template. And then you have your joint. And the drawing does continue up here. It doesn't show very well now, but I can still see a stripe line. So that's the outer curve. Bring that in. The other centre line. Then that's the shape of the stone. A copy of the drawing on the floor. A drawing which had remained there for several hundred years. A lot of old templates are still kept on the walls here. You never know when they might come in useful for restoration work. That is, if anyone knew which stones they represented. Nowadays, the drawings are made on paper and the templates are made of zinc. But the principle is the same. left by the tools now as in the past allow us to identify different phases of the building work. And it's also possible to discover which mason did what. their work with individual signatures so we don't know the name of this man or of this one but we can recognize their work the reasons for such marks are not entirely understood but building accounts show that rank and fire masons were often paid by piecework so if you didn't make your mark you didn't get paid for cutting your stone as the walls went up scaffolding was needed medieval scaffolding was made of wood with working platforms of wooden hurdles. This hole is where a horizontal scaffold pole was lodged. It's called a putt log hole. Obvious, really. Yes, it's where you put the logs. But medieval builders certainly weren't simple. The walls of a church like this were made up of an inner and outer skin of fine limestone masonry. These enclosed a core of lime mortar and rubble but when we look closely, we find that much of this structure isn't solid at all. Instead, it's made up of passages and staircases within the walls. These help to make the structure lighter, and they provide access to its upper parts, both during and after construction. And these walkways nowadays provide access for central heating, or electricity, or for maintenance. Up here, we can see how the huge interior spaces of the church were covered. They were bridged by a series of intersecting arches called ribs. And these formed a framework to hold the curving panels of rubble masonry in place. They were probably held by temporary timber shuttering. We can see just how this worked if we go up to the roofs above the vaults. Here we are above the vaults that we've just seen from below. And I'm actually going to go down the ladder and stand on top of the vaults. These are the panels of rubble masonry. 
They're quite thin, only a matter of about 30 centimeters, but surprisingly strong. Or perhaps it's not that much of a surprise when you think about the strength of other curved structures, such as a basket or an egg. Even so, the vaults have considerable weight, pushing outwards, and there has to be some way of preventing the walls from bulging. What they did was to transmit the force via a series of what are, in effect, flying bridges, and then outside to buttresses, and so to the ground. Well, that's the modern theory. How the builders worked it out is more difficult to know. It was probably by a method of trial and error. And talking of error, you may have noticed that Beverly Minster has only got a stub where the central tower should be. Roberta's in there now. Error up here was something to be avoided. Nevertheless, early in the 13th century, something went very seriously wrong in this part of the building. This decorative detail shows that there was a plan to carry up this part of the building into the tower, but these cracks show us that this was a plan that was abandoned. This incident reminds us that only the medieval success stories are still with us. Any idea we may have that medieval builders were infallible is rather biased by the fact that we no longer see their failure. Above the vaults, there's the roof. This timber roof dates from the 14th century. There is a lot of heavy material up here, large blocks of stone, the timber for these roofs, and even whole tree trunks. So, how did they get up here? Well, they got up in the same way that we got our film equipment up. Once the tower had been built, a crane was put in. It's still there. But there was no electric power in the Middle Ages. like this. So there's more to building a great church than meets the eye. It isn't just a matter of stones and timber. That only accounted for about a fifth of the cost. For example, there's carriage of materials with the food needed for the animals. Lime for the mortar. And ferramenta, that's all the metalwork. And, of course, fees for the architect and his assistants and apprentices. But the biggest cost, then as now, was labour. This was the breakdown of expenditure at Adderbury in 1415, but Beverly Minster probably was similar in proportion. of the tower, the striking thing, apart from this view, is the vast expanse of lead on the roofs. This was brought from the Pennines, at least 80 kilometers from here. And on it, or in it, is the plumber's signature. The signatures of tradesmen who worked on this building over hundreds of years. Plumbers, masons, joiners. People who together built and maintained a building, and who were commemorated by their graffiti. The next time someone describes something hopeless as medieval, you can put them right, because 700 years have been seen by this structure beneath my feet, the work of the master builders.